Welcome everybody. This is the introductory video for both Math 125A and 135. So these two courses uh, are both logic courses, but they are independent of each other. They are not, they are different topics and they don't need each other. Um, um, they're both a mathematical logic and one of them, as we're gonna see, is about the foundations of logic uh, and formal systems. And the other one is more about the axioms uh, to develop all the mathematics. I get into that in a second. So, but they have the very basic ideas uh, is common, so that's why I'm doing this joint video. So one of the uh, main goals of mathematical logic is to develop the foundations for mathematics. There are other goals, but we do other things in mathematical logic, but one of them is that to develop the foundations for all of mathematics. So if you imagine mathematics as a big building that is where things are built on top of each other and like a big edifice, then logic, one of the aspects of logic is to look at the foundations of that. What is all this standing on? So the first thing we need to look at is a formal system. So this will be a place where we can develop mathematics uh, in a formal way. So what are these formal systems uh, good for? So what do we need them for? So what well, I mentioned before that uh, they are going to give us the foundations for the whole edifice of mathematics. So in a way, um, they tell us that we can be, if you're doing something in the formal system, we can be sure that uh, it's gonna be uh, correct and, and there is no subjectivity to it. There is no, I'm trying to convince this other mathematician about it. It's like, this is a formal system. Um, but that's in theory, because in practice it's very hard to actually uh, do approves in the formal system, but it's good to know the foundations are there. I get back to this thing about doing it in a second. Um, for instance, 130, 40 years ago, uh, Cantor and Bernard Russell and other people started to find uh, paradoxes, uh, reasonings that were completely sound, or they look like reasonable, they look like the reasonings mathematicians were doing at the time, and that led to contradictions. Like for instance, the Barber paradox, um, which in set theory becomes um, considered the set of all the sets that don't contain themselves. I don't know if you heard about this, but uh, once mathematicals are becoming more abstract and abstract, and people were doing abstract uh, proofs, then it was easy to fall into the trap of doing something that is uh, not uh, allowed or that will lead to a contradiction. Um, so it was good to develop something where we can know what we are standing on, on a strong footing. Um, a second um, reason that why the formal systems are good is that in logic we can study them as mathematical objects themselves. Because now a formal system, a proof, a theorem, a construction, they become themselves concrete mathematical objects. So we can study proofs theorems in a mathematical way. So we can use mathematics to study mathematics itself. So that's why it's called metamathematics. Um, and that's where kind of, that's how we can prove Gödel's theorem that some things are not provable. Uh, for that, we need, to, we need to be able to prove about things being provable or not. Um, and a third um, application uh, is that um, Computers can play with formal systems. Uh, that's a more, more modern thing, but it's actually becoming more and more popular. So I was saying that uh, in practice, it's very hard to write a proof in a formal system. Like when you write a proof, you write it in English and you're just trying to convince uh, a mathematical reader that your argument has no holes and it's like perfectly logical and sound, but if you want to write your full proof, like step by step in a formal system, you go crazy. Um, but if you manage to do it and you do it on a computer, computer can go and check step by step that every step you did was correct. You don't need a human to do that because now it's very formal. So, so now you have essentially a proof that your proof is 100% correct. Um, and that's actually useful for some things. So it started being useful for uh, some programs, like uh, to verify that a program is doing what it's supposed to be doing, so to prove that a program is doing what it's supposed to do, which is sometimes very important if the program is 
controlling something that is very important, like, I don't know, your heart. Like yeah. Now, uh, in the last couple of decades, people started to actually prove, like write down full detail proofs in a formal system of some well-known theorems in mathematics. And sometimes these tasks, tasks are like huge because like for big theorems, uh, there are a lot of little things that are not written, but if you want to convince the computer that everything is right, you need to add every step. And now there are programs that help you uh, do the silly, the small steps. And so you don't go too crazy. You still go a bit crazy, I guess. But, um, so right, having a formal system allow us to now get computers to help us lay fireproofs and maybe even write some. To start introducing formal systems, one thing uh, we need to think about is, okay, so what is a proof? Here is a definition. A proof is an argument that uses logical steps to show that a mathematical statement follows from certain assumptions. Let's get deeper into what this actually means. There are a few things here that are important. First, what we're talking about proving here are concrete mathematical statements. We're not talking about proving an ambiguous statement about the weather. We are talking about concrete mathematical statements. So we need to be explicit about what we mean by a concrete mathematical statement. And for that, we need to define a formal language. A proof is made out of logical steps. We only in practice when writing a proof, we can use any reasoning we like, so long as everybody agrees that the steps we are taking are logical. But if we want to talk about proofs as concrete objects, to be able to prove things about them, we need to be explicit about which logical steps we are allowed to use. These logical steps are called rules. Third, we need assumptions. When you write a proof, you always use previous knowledge. That previous knowledge usually comes in forms of theorems that were proved before, and those theorems use previous knowledge. And if you keep on going backwards, mm -hmm. you will eventually reach statements that are so basic that you just cannot prove. But they are basic enough that you don't need to prove them. Those are the axioms. More than a hundred years ago, these men wanted to build a formal system for all of mathematics where all statements could be proved in a purely formal and syntactical way. By that I mean in a way that only involves manipulating symbols, following certain rules in a purely mechanical way, without having to even know what the symbols mean. This way you could be sure about something being true or not, in a purely mechanical way, uh, that nobody could argue with. So let's see how that worked out at the end. So let's see what a formal system is. It consists of three things. A language, a set of rules, and a list of axioms. Language. To define a language, we need symbols. They are like the letters of the alphabet. And grammatical rules that tell us how to put these symbols together. Here is a standard list of symbols. The first symbols, 0, 1, plus, times, belongs to, form what is called a vocabulary. And those are variable. You can change them for some other symbols if you want to work with something else. These ones are good enough. The latter ones, equality and or not exist for all. The variable symbols and the parentheses are called the logical symbols. And they are essentially fixed in all first order logic. You can modify them slightly. For instance, here you can add the implication symbol because you can just define it from the other. So you may add it or not. But essentially, these are the logical symbols. Okay, then we need to put the symbols together. And for that, we need grammatical rules. Here's a standard set of rules, but don't worry about the details. I don't want to get into them right now. I just want you to see what they look like. Essentially, when you see a string of symbols, you're going to be able to tell if it makes sense or doesn't. For instance, this one here obviously doesn't make sense, while this other one, for every x that exists a y, such as y plus y equals x, or y plus y equals x plus 1, is a sequence of symbols that makes sense. All right, let's go into the rules. These are the rules of logical thinking the rules that we use when we write proofs. For example, there is a rule that says that if you can prove not phi, that is, the negation of phi, where phi is a grammatically correct sequence of symbols, and you can prove phi or psi, then you can prove psi. For instance, if phi was the sentence x equals y, and psi was the sentence z equals 1, then this rule will read as follows. We express such rules in the following format. If you can prove the statements on the top, you can prove the statements on the bottom. Here is an example of a full set of rules of first order logic. Again, don't worry about the details. I just wanted to show you what they look like. Axioms. These are the statements that describe the very basic behavior of whatever you're working with. Numbers, sets, groups, rings, whatever you're working with. The axioms don't need to be proved. They are used as basic assumptions within our proofs. If you're going to use them in our proof, they better be true. So. 
the very obviously true. And hopefully we'll have enough axioms to derive everything we want. As we'll see, this is too much to hope for. Here's an example of a list of axioms. These are the piano axioms. They are the standard axioms to work with when you're working with the natural numbers. They start with the very basic properties of zero, one, plus, and times. And then we have the axioms for induction, which allow you to do proofs by induction. There is another list of axioms that is used to axiomatize all of mathematics. It's called the sermero frankel set theory. Okay, so now we know what a formal system is. Here come the key points. The language is complete. So all mathematical statements can be expressed in this language. Once you get used to working in this language, you're going to see that every mathematical statement you want to make, you can make it in this formal language using these grammatical rules. So that's good. All right, then the rules, they're also complete. Okay, this is not a simple observation like the previous ones. There is no reason to believe at first that these few rules are going to be enough to formalize all arguments mathematicians want to make. Arguments come in all shapes of forms, but surprisingly, they are enough. This is another of Gettle's famous theorems. It's called the completeness theorem. And it says that if you can prove something, you can prove it using only these rules. It actually says that if a statement is true in all possible universes, then it can be proved using these rules. Okay, there are some subtleties here that I'm leaving for another time. The axioms, though, are not complete. And this is what the incompleteness theorem says. Gettle proved both the completeness and the incompleteness theorems. It's not that he couldn't make up his mind about completeness or incompleteness. It's just that completeness was about the rules and incompleteness was about the axioms. Okay, so the two courses uh, split uh, right here. So 125 is gonna be about the language part and the rules part of the formal system. And, uh, and also about semantics, about the language and probability and other things. We're gonna prove those completeness theorems that we just mentioned. And uh, the Gödel one is not an easy one. Gödel completeness theorem, that's gonna be our main theorem at the end of the class. Um, and then 135 is gonna be about the axioms part. And in that one, you're gonna develop the axioms for set theory. And set theory, is, these are the axioms where all mathematics can be done. So these are axioms for all the mathematics and they are kind of now uh, widely accepted as the axioms for mathematics. Uh, which, as why, why, which as I mentioned, they are not complete. I mean, the area of set theory of logic studies uh, theorems of mathematics or statements that are that cannot be proved from the axioms that are beyond these axioms. Uh, well, we're not going to get into that. Maybe we're going to mention a couple of those, but uh, we're not going to get into those much. We're just going to go slowly through the axioms to understand the whole development of set theory and how it works as a foundation for mathematics. And we're gonna look at something that follows from this development, which is the study of ordinals and cardinals that are very important in set theory. Okay, that's it for today. Uh, next time we'll do separate videos, one for 125, one for 135, and we'll go into the different topics. See you next time.